everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast interview edition. Now, about, uh, I think it was back in April, re- Tom and I reviewed the film Blood Covered Chocolate. And one of the things that kept coming up in our review is we would love to get inside the head of the writer director of the film. Well, our, <laughs> our wish has been granted. With us tonight is Monty Light, writer and director of Blood Covered Chocolate. Monty, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Oh, I yes. really appreciate it. And it's really, it's because of you. You reached out to us. You uh, you saw our review and you, and you listened. And then you said, I'd love to come on and talk about it. And it took me yeah, forever absolutely. to get back to you. And I'd apologize for that. It's just life has been busy in front of and behind the mic. <laughs> and so it just took us a little time. Absolutely. No, I completely understand. Uh, thank you. Yes, for having me on. It, I, I'm excited to do this because... As of right now, there's no, uh, there's nothing on the horizon for a physical release of Blood Covered Chocolate quite yet. So there's no, nothing on the horizon for a commentary or anything. Um, but I'm always excited to to talk about the film, and also um, I'm, I just love hearing people's thoughts about their experience of it. You know, and that was really, really interesting. Excellent, good. I, I'm glad we didn't uh, upset you or or disappoint you or anything in our reviews. No, no, I think uh, I think your read on it was was pretty spot on. Oh, nice, excellent, thank you. See, see, I was prepared for okay. We'll sit back, relax, uh, while you just roast us for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's uh, it's one of those things where I mean the I, I think it's important for people to understand that the you know the philosophy of how film is enjoyed is a continuing discussion. It's not about who's right and who's wrong or um, any particular interpretation being the sole interpretation of, of any film. So I think it's, it's important to have podcasts, to have places where people who are passionate about movies can not only educate their audience, but also um, just air their thoughts, talk through things, have conversations about it. That's, you know, what art is supposed to do. Because I've met and become friends with several independent filmmakers and have gone to their screenings and, and seen their films that I, I've grown to really enjoy the independent film and independent horror, independent sci-fi in particular, just because that's my, you know, my, my genre of choice. And we are so lucky to get the opportunities to have some of these screeners come across our desks because unfortunately the, the, plight of many independent filmmakers is getting their stuff out there yeah it's true it's very true and so it's it's a lot of fun to have this come across our desk and give us a chance to watch it and do a short review and you know we always try to find even if the film overall isn't something that we really loved we try to find you know is there a positive is there an actor is there a story thread give us something to really uh, discuss and talk about and to uh, hopefully help get the film out and maybe it get, it'll get the film out and do an extra couple of eyes. Absolutely. And that was also, I think something that was very, um, I was very grateful for in your original podcast was at the end of it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where if it didn't um, necessarily gel for you to still have the, Oh, it's a, it's an interesting thing to explore. It's an interesting experience, you know, uh, because many years ago, I um, I actually worked as a reviewer myself um, on the, in the written side of it. I was a uh, um, for a website that is sadly not around anymore. But I was a horror, horror reviewer myself for a while, yeah. and uh, I also understand very much that obligation of these things should be supported. They should be sought out. They should be uh, dissected. Um, here's just one guy's opinion about what did and didn't work or um, what they were going for, whether or not they achieved it, what I found in there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it would always, you know, I would try in very rare occasions. Was there ever a film where I'm like, it's really not worth your time. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, I've, I've, you know, been there as well, but most of the time it's like, yeah, go ahead and, you know, try to try to find this. And, um, and I want to know what you think of it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, absolutely. It can be very subjective. I mean, we didn't like it. Doesn't mean that someone else isn't going to see it and just think it's one of the most innovative and, and creative things I've ever seen. And right. I certainly would never come on here and say absolutely do not go and watch this. 
although I say that, and I think there has been one film, I remember one film that I really did have to put out a review, just as like, no, oh, this was really not worth your time. It, it happens very rarely for me. I try very hard not to pan a film. It's, it's one of those things where it's, if you don't have something nice to say, best not say anything at all. And I kind of right. try to follow that that rule when it comes to reviews. Right. Absolutely. And then, I mean, obviously, it's one of those things where, uh, as you know, film film is, uh, you know, or as we hope, will always be forever. So it's one of those things that it's like there are certain movies that you revisit and they rise in your assessment or they change based off of your own life experience. So there's aspects of it that you didn't even necessarily pick up on before and sometimes you know i i freely admit there are many you know classic films and more obscure films where i have i have completely 180 my own opinion on it and then i look back and i was like wow younger me just straight up didn't get it or maybe that's not even the best way to put it it's like uh younger me didn't appreciate all of the nuances because i hadn't grown into it i hadn't grown into this film right absolutely oh i'm sure there's probably a many films that had I seen it, or maybe if I did see it when I was a, a much younger person, I'd be like, God, this is so boring. And then you go back and watch it as an adult and go, that is some of the best dialogue I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and even recently, uh, when we started this year's particular adventure for our, our theme, um, and we started with the never ending story, uh, you watch, the, the perspective changes based on where you sit in life. Um, now that we're adults with children and all that, you start to look at that some of that movie like, that kid was out all night? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, where are the parents? Where, where, where's the dad finding this kid? Um, so it, it's amazing, even though we can put ourselves back in our, our, our seat back then, you you now have a new perspective because you have attacked this thing from a completely different age. Absolutely. Um, right. You know, it's interesting. Weirdly enough, that was one of the movies that I, I did sort of 180 on because I was very young when I first saw a never ending story. And I was with a, a bunch of just people at uh, a night over and it was just like, Oh, let's, you know, it was the classic, like, let's watch something that our parents don't want us to watch, which, you know, uh, yeah. And so it was the never ending story. And I just remember um, the whole time I was watching it, having this creeping sickness feeling as I was watching the film, it was just making me, my, my stomach churn. And of course, older me is just like, yeah, it was churning because of the dark fantasy elements that are at play it there. Sure. But young me was just like, no, make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> what? You don't like seeing a horse sink into the mud? <laughs> You know, it's interesting. Um, I think what was more spooky to me at that time and like really giving me the, the churning at the at the time was um oh oh forgive me pop culture, but um, the the flying dog Yeah, Falcor. Falcor, yes. I just remember always thinking that Falcor could eat him at any time. <laughs> Yeah, I, so close I, to his face. I, I remember times during that film, too, where he's right up close by the face. You're like, he could lick him or he could just devour him. <laughs> Absolutely. Movie's uh, over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it's just like, Old this friend. is dark, man. Anything could happen. You know? Or like, I mean, that's the other funny thing is you become super nostalgic for the the little things that stand out to you about, like, your first experience with movies are like, you know, when you were young and that was your first introduction to not only genre or like the tropes of genre, but just, I remember clearly distinctly at another like sleepover or whatever, watching um, the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, 1990. Live action. And, and, yep. The live action. And it was the first time that I ever heard a curse word in a movie. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, when, when Raphael's chasing Casey Jones, like, damn! I'm like, oh my god, he just said damn! <laughs> Clearly you needed to attend Catholic education with me. You'd have learned those a lot earlier. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, which is also just hilarious considering my own writing now. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's the journey you, you, you take where, I, you know, I think... 
I think film in general, especially when it comes to like horror film, it's it's a moth to the light sort of situation where you know there's just those formative moments in your life where movies like all movies feel like there's some sort of forbidden lantern show or just something that it's like, okay, you're getting an insight into a a world you've never seen, whether it's created or whether it's trying to mimic a particular time period or even a a different part of the world that you may never get to in your life. Um, But it's like, this is the way people lived or this is the way people acted in this situation and everything. And there's something really like beguiling about that. And if you don't lose that wonderment, then you probably would grow up to be a filmmaker. <laughs> and then every, everybody else is, just goes on and has their entertainment for two hours, and that's it. And that's sort of the, the dividing line of how your life goes as a filmmaker. So you, since you opened the, the door right there talking about the formative films, uh, what are some of the formative ones that put you on the path to you film your filmmaking? Absolutely, yeah. So for me, it was one of those things where I was born uh, in. <laughs> sorry, I'm not to start a story that begins like right at the beginning, but it's like I was born uh, in Tulsa, thirteen Oklahoma. billion years ago. I know, right, <laughs> right. Uh, when when the Earth was first being formed. No, uh, I <laughs> I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So um, growing up. I was very, very fortunate that at the age of five, I was actually on my first film set. Oh, I, wow. Yeah. Nice. I was um, cast as in, in as a young, small kid character in a, um, in a music video that was shooting out there. And I was able to get an agent um, for like a couple of years just working that side of things. So very early on, I had, uh, you know, a distinct impression of the two sides of of how the sausage is made, so to speak, where it's mm-hmm. like that that magic happened right there on an actual set where it's like, here's what we film. And, you know, you see all of the, the, the spit and polish and wires that are held together to make this thing. And then there it is being projected for you. And it's this completely different world. And so I immediately fell in love with that aspect of it from from doing. But it was also one of those things that's like when I was young and I was going out and doing, you know, auditions and getting the odd local thing, like I did like a TV commercial here or there, nothing huge, or like going and being an extra in a made-for-TV movie, um, usually going down to Dallas because that's where auditions were going out of. Mm-hmm. I probably still are in that sort of region. I I knew very early on that I wanted to be an artist and I knew that um, both of my parents are actually musicians. Um, And in fact, my dad wrote the music for blood cover chocolate. He's written the music for all of my films. So early on it was, I, you know, was supported to be an artist and I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to be an actor. And then as time went on and I started to get older, like into my teens, um, that's when I started to connect the dots in terms of being able to tell the stories behind the camera. And I think the big formidable moment for me where that became a reality was actually when I saw Kenneth Branagh's uh, Henry V, and that was 1989. And not only was it a big epiphany for me because Branagh was able to make Shakespeare come to life and suddenly I understood Shakespeare's writing and you know I was falling in love with that as well but I I was the first time that I was distinctly aware of somebody who was both in front of and behind the camera telling this story completely um and having that kind of authorship to it and I was like wow you know he's an actor and he directs maybe I could you know that that's something that I would love to do you know eventually I realized that I I just didn't my passion waned in terms of wanting to do the acting side of things, which has a whole other whole other demand to it. <laughs> uh, I actually went to college uh, to get an acting degree, and that's where I was also starting to do some directing. Um, I mean, I directed my first short film when I was 16, but I, I was doing some directing for stage, just in school, you know, going and training through all of that. And I, I was just in the midst of working with people who were such talented actors, so much more talented than I was. But uh, I just knew that I could communicate with them, that I had this ability, you know, because I had that passion for acting, that background and the importance of how 
character is story and actor is character at the end of the day, that it's like that approach to it coupled with my, you know, extreme interest that I was having in the, um, in the technical side of things, not only, you know, the history of cinematographers and camera work and all of that, but also, um, the styles and modes and, and of art and theater and writing and all of that, that just was taking over everything. Uh, for me, I, I trace my very first exposure to horror, um, to something wicked this way comes the, um, Jack Clayton, John Clayton, Jack Clayton, uh, film. <laughs> yeah. The film, the film he made for D- for Disney basically. Uh, okay. you know, yeah. And, um, that was the very first horror film that I ever saw. And, you know, it was, it just blew me away. I thought it was so, you know, it was Ray Bradbury. who was one of my favorite authors as a kid. And, you know, Jonathan Price, Jason Robards, and all of them performing at Pam Greer. Um, it was just one of those things where I, I wasn't even aware of, like, the genre distinctions at that point. It was just this, the type of story that was being told, where I realized the power of, um, magic on film and sort of surrealism and using fables and all of that dream logic to explore psychological state. And that, to me, uh, in its purest form, is the thing that unites all horror. There, you know, there are many different subgenres, there are many different you know, styles and tropes and everything, but I feel like that is, when you cut it down to its core, the essence of horror is being able to explore the human animal with no holds barred. Finally, first and foremost, like the, the big, I think, question that always comes up in horror is what is your favorite horror film? <laughs> um, so I can unequivocally say that my favorite horror film is Dario Argento's Suspiria, 1977. And that's another distinct memory. I remember watching it with my best friend. We were, I think, probably 16. And uh, that was the moment where I, I was just, you know, brought into this painterly eye that Argento had, the, the vivid colors, the, uh, the use of music, um, the way he was very clever at making the audience aware of both what he was doing, but also viscerally experiencing it. Like, I think probably one of the best examples for me is in the very first scene, which was just such a, an epiphany to me uh, when I first watched it, where she's just walking, you know, through the airport. And it's like, you have the shots of Jessica Harper walking and it's just the normal sounds of the ambient airport. And then it cuts to her POV as she's going towards the storm and there's the magical goblin music playing and the storm outside with the blue lights. And it's just starting to bring in the hints of it. And then it would immediately hard cut back to her in the regular sound. And I was like, Oh, he wants you to be aware of these tricks that he is playing and then he will win you over. And I was, yeah, it was just from there. It was one of those things where I just couldn't, um, I couldn't go back to realism after that. So it's like, even even at, at its most, you know, docu-realistic style in horror, something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for instance, you're still aware of the aesthetic decisions that are being made to elevate the, the visceral emotional experience, which is where the horror lies. And that's just far more interesting to me than straight drama, basically. Well, it's often... a enjoyable to watch or to write or anything is to go in those darker places. It, those are the places where, I mean, hopefully you never find yourself. Those right. are the places that you want to go in that fantasy world. I mean, and that's, you know, that's the other, I don't know if, if you've encountered this many times, but like when you have a passion specifically for horror in film and fiction, there's always inevitably that, you know, conversation that you're having in polite company where they're like, oh, it's just so horrible. It's just so dark. How can you be into that? And it's one of those things that it's like, why do people ride roller coasters? They they get on them so that they can feel the the reality that will inevitably come, which is death, but they get to do it in a controlled environment to learn more about themselves. And I always like to tell tell people that it's like, hey, it's better to channel your darker thoughts into creating art than into creating destruction in the real world. So right. <laughs> I even recently read something excerpts from a study that had suggested 
that if you appreciate dark humor, that um, it's actually a sign of a higher IQ. <laughs> um, and the reasoning behind that, the, the thought that goes into that goes along with what we're talking about here. It's that that analysis of the thing that we don't want to think about the most. If you can wrap your head around dark notions from a pers- from entirely a philosophical and psychological perspective and let them not control you, it, not your base person, there is something to that. So if you can find humor in the dark place, if you can figure out what your response under these safer uh <laughs> circumstances you reveal a little more about your own character as you think about this absolutely absolutely and you know that's the there's also a universality to it i mean obviously there's a lot of strata uh when it comes to i you know that that's why i mean tell me if if you gentlemen agree with this but it's like as i went along you know reviewing and just continuing to soak in all the amazing variety of horror films you know within the genre as well as reviewing them and everything it's one of those things where it's like the after a while the least interesting part of a horror film is whether or not it scared you because it it, it's it almost becomes nil or it's one of those things that it's like there there aren't like horror films for me at least nowadays especially also as a filmmaker um it's not like it's not like i'm scared the way i was when i was a kid but I also right. do appreciate every single time what the effort that's going into the construction of it. Um, it's it's always pure filmmaking. It's like being able to create tension, uh, being able to create anticipation, and all of the other um, elements of that kind of pacing that's very specific to horror film. Uh, in a way, it, it just gives you an edge, I think, uh, in terms of the quality of being a filmmaker. I think that that's also, you know, an important learning tool. And, and I mean, I grew up also very much loving uh, Hitchcock. So his he was another filmmaker that was also, in many ways, wanting you to be aware of the tricks that he's pulling, but from sort of unlocking the puzzle box, box tricks within his film you discover the theme. Um, it's it's that visual language side of it. And, you know, he was the, the big proponent, uh, which I absolutely agree with, of, you know, if a film is truly great, you can turn off the sound and understand all of the story just from the visual, just from the way it's being told visually. I'm going to use that as a segue, because uh, if you've heard our review and all that, and I want to get into yeah. uh, uh, um, blood-covered chocolate, uh since this is a horror film, but I get a sense not entirely. Uh, <laughs> it, it's the psychological aspect. So right. I want to get um, you've heard what we said, but we want to hear those things that we don't get to know because we're just watching the film. Uh, where's your head at as, as you're taking us through this story? Is it more the um the agony of a tortured mind, or is there an actual um, boogeyman in this case, uh, vampires uh, that are actually driving the story from your perspective? I would say that Blood Covered Chocolate um, up to this point is the most personal film that I've ever made. And it's personal because um, I've been uh, sober from alcohol for about four years. And it was a uh, huge moment me- for me to realize that I was powerless against alcohol and that it was controlling me and it was taking me down a path that I didn't want to be in. Um, and so that being said, um, where I was coming out of in terms of the the darkness in my mind, the fact that I realized that... Um, I was weak and something was more powerful than I, and that it was slowly draining me of what could be my life and certainly all the things that I loved and wanted in life. That's when I realized that I had to make a movie about somebody dealing with that pain and that it had to be somebody dealing with a vampire 
because within horror, um, there's no better metaphor right. for that than the vampire. And to me, if you're asking the question, like, is it all inside a tortured mind or is it all the product of an actual boogeyman that's out there? To me, I feel like the nature of the film, whether you're going to like hearing this or not, is that they are, they are one and the same. And that's what informed the visual stylistic choices of it. So on the one hand, it was it took its inspiration directly from Nosferatu, Murnau's original 22 film, uh, 1922 film. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, coming from a place where I wanted to also show my own appreciation and do a little love letter to the history of horror, how it affected me, how its aesthetic and its um, and its structure uh, had been just experienced by myself and wanting to give back into that. So there's tons of moments in that film that are uh, take inspiration, are bits of homage, et cetera, et cetera. But the black and white mixed with the color collage and the subliminals and the kaleidoscope and all of those other things that appear in the film are meant to create a sustained feeling of nightmare so that you never at any point in the film think that you're in the real world. You are in his mind and his mind is plagued with vampires. The question is, what form do they take? Well, the, the black and white and everything, as you were saying, it's kind of an homage to uh, Nosferatu and everything. But you took a very interesting angle by going for the, uh, wasn't it the, the, the Vietnamese uh, mm -hmm. uh, lore? That was an yeah, interesting yeah. angle to take. One, not done much in uh, Western films. Yeah, and that's the, that was the reason for doing it. 100% is that I um, I loved, obviously, Mystics and Valley because that is directly referenced in the film. Um, but at the same time, I desperately wanted to open myself up to exploring the folklore of vampires in this particular film outside of the Western Catholic perception of it. Uh, simply because, in the Eastern European perception of it. Sure. Simply because... You know, not only is, I mean, you could say that vampire films are as old as film, more than likely, pretty much, basically. With Nosferatu being 100 yeah. years old. Yeah. Right, exactly. And it's one of those things that it's like everybody and their mom has done some variation of, of vampires. And they've been used many, many times to symbolize many, many, many different things. So you saying that it wasn't actually seen all that much in Western film, I mean, that was, that was the motivation behind it. Because it's like, I've, you know, watching Malaysian or Hindi film um, or Southeast Asian film, knowing that there are um, elements to the grander vampire folkloric myth that hadn't even necessarily traveled over as much, I wanted to bring that in there. Um, and I thought that it was also a, a wonderful opportunity to create a visual synergy between, um, between Massimo and Tien, where it's like the story that she tells him is the story that he then experiences. experiences. And I think that on a deeper level, thematically, that also showed um, his connection to her, that she is the one that's literally haunting his nightmares or his dreams the whole time. Somebody that that he desires, that he loves, even though he doesn't even entirely know what that means because he's somebody still trying to be sober. It's still a relationship that's very fresh for them, but it's something that's that's hot, like hot and something that's very um, much his sticking point in a world that's racked with people trying to take advantage of him or hurt him. Yeah, in a way, it's like he needs to feed off of her energy to keep going, even before he becomes a vampire. Uh, and I think that's what I latched on to with the, this film and, and my interpretation from, from our 
from our Chris's and I's conversation is that and why I asked the original question about is there an actual boogeyman? I, the fact that, that she brings up her version of the folklore, right. um, and then all of a sudden it manifests uh, in his life. It starts that it starts you down that road of is this really happening or is this how he's dealing with um, his addictions, his his fight to become sober, um, the relationships that he has as dysfunctional as they are. And, and that was what I was enjoying in the film is how so much is coming at this character all at once. You don't actually get to know entirely what's real and what he is just perceiving because he's going through this experience. Right. And I mean, I, w- I wouldn't uh, put it past a little bit of the DNA of something akin to Jacob's Ladder, probably finding its way a bit in there, uh, or an incident at Owl Creek Bridge. It, going back to, because that's another um, aspect of um, art and genre that I'm also very much in love with, is surrealism. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I love Louis Boudwell <clears throat> and, and Dolly and... Um, you know, even the more recent surrealists, like elements of David Lynch and all of that. But to me, it's one of those things that the nature of surrealism, especially on film, is that the emotional is the textual and the textual is the emotional. If the character is having a thought or a dream or an image that latches in his mind, we bring that reality because it is its own kind of reality. Hence why, I mean, it's one of those things where when you watch something like like An Illusion Dog, you have this immediate emotional visceral reaction from the opening scene of that, the opening shot of the slice in the eye. And and there's definitely that moment where you're like, wow, did that eye really get sliced? (laughs) But at the same time, the, the whole setup of it, it's, you just know that there's more at play to what is being expressed there. And then you start to do the search. And once again, it's one of those things where it's like, not not everybody wants to go down the path of a film like that, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but I feel like film itself acts as almost a, a kind of collective dream. So I feel like leaning into that um, and embracing that is just natural. It just always seemed natural to me in terms of what film is and what it does. And it, it, it frees you, you know, it, 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 it frees you to, to do sequences like in the movie when we did the, um, the faux continuous shot um, for just a little under 11 minutes. And um, it was one of those things where it, all of that was in purpose of showing the machinations of the emotional trauma that Massimo is working through in real time on the one hand. And then on the other hand, to amp up the tension of what is, I mean, without spoiling too much, but what is his first (laughs) sort of vampiric hunt, which is also very essential to the vampire film. Um, And I just realized that I was like, in order to show the anguish that he is experiencing over having to do this kill in order to say, sustain himself, it has to go on painfully, you know, as, as he resists and resists and resists. Yeah. And um, I also thought it was a very interesting opportunity to bring in a, just a colorful character who could play out for basically one scene and start its own kind of mini short film of the story, which is another hallmark that repeats a lot in um, in some surrealism, in the sense that it's like those those drifters come into a, a, a character's narrative, and they're experienced um, the way we experience uh, a flash in our dreams, where it's like, oh yeah, I remember that person, I was having that conversation, but it was different because I was in a different place. And, but they, they stand out to you and they have a, a distinctive flavor to it. And then suddenly they vanish out of, out of your mind and you're suddenly in a different locale dealing with something different. And that's the kind of dream logic that follows there. 
I love the idea of looking at film as, as a dream because then that also leaves for everyone who witnessed who experiences it for their own interpretations. Uh, it, just like dreams can be reinterpreted by different people in different ways, so can the film. Uh, your idea about you know, a character can come into a film, it can be there for a scene, you can say a line, it can be enigmatic, whatever, and then disappear, and you're left wondering, was that important? Oh, I think it was important. <clears throat> I don't think that was important. I think that was... I think that, that yeah. where a lot of where I see some reviews where people think, oh, and th that character did absolutely nothing like or did they did did it make you think though did did it make you wonder so i think yeah. that maybe that was the point of that particular character that wandered through this film absolutely i mean it's think about you know an absolute stone cold classic like blue velvet where we all remember dean stockwell oh so well um <laughs> but dean stockwell is in one scene comes in does a lot of very strange, very enticing things. And, you know, the, the usual read on all of that is that he is the, the sort of strange embodiment of the aspiration of, like, badassitude and glamour and chutzpah of Dennis Hopper. But there's absolutely no point in that scene <laughs> where David Lynch just tells you that. It's one of those things that you just, you, you realize that by the way sort of Hopper treats um, Dean Stockwell and the way Dean Stockwell returns. And you, you have all of this play out in only a matter of minutes. Um, and that's actually one of my, uh, one of my favorite transitions in all of film is when, um, when Dennis Hopper screams, screams the, you know, I'll fuck anything that moves. Ha ha ha. And then just jump cuts <laughs> out of the shots <laughs> as the, as the, uh, as the engines roar and it cuts out to it. And it's one of those things, once again, a single moment like that, you're like, well, that didn't really happen. Right. And it's like, <laughs> Does it matter? You know, it's, it, that's part of the nightmare that our hero is is going through in that movie. You mentioned, or I, you didn't mention. I'm sorry. Um, I was just trying to go back to another point, and then I lost my my train jump track <laughs> as I was speaking. You're just imagining Dennis Hopper. Right? Uh, well, you know, he's uh, he's going through this uh, of the um, dreamlike state that we're discussing right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, Jumping back a little bit, just talking about the you know, the uh, the idea of the, of the vampire in this particular folklore, the Vietnamese, but also you've seen it in, in Western and European cultures and everything too, is the idea of the shapeshifter. Mm. It really lends itself well for a film like this, where you're dealing with someone that you know. How does this person's demons manifest? You know, was it the alcohol? Is it the drugs? Is it women? A, using a vampire as a shapeshifter. It can be all of them or one of them. And that works really well in, in a tell, trying to tell a story like this. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting, too, because that, that definitely was emergence, once again, of the two sides of, of doing the story, um, of, of bringing in the personal of, all right, the, the big theme of the film is, is me channeling, uh, you know, my demons with addiction and then putting it into the template of the folklore of the vampire and exploring it in a new and different way. Um, at the same time, there is also a, a practical side of it. Because so it's, you know, I, I, it's one of those things, I am a lower budget filmmaker and working within that medium, you have to get very, very innovative. And so it's one of those things that it's like, you know, when you're at it, when, when you're at a certain budget level, um, it's like, well, I probably shouldn't be making a zombie film because there's no way that I'm going to get enough people to show up to be zombies <laughs> and zombie films require a lot of people just to make it work and then at the same time with the vampire it's like okay so you know right from the bat the get-go when I was writing it's like I'm not going to be able to make them turn into an animal I'm not going to make them be able to do a bat I'm not going to I'm not going to go, you know, 1940s universal monster having a bat floating there, you know, uh, because it's just it's not going to fulfill the purpose. I'm not making camp, um, which wasn't obviously camp when they made it. But now we interpret it that way. Right. Um, and so it was one of those things that it's like, and, you know, I don't I don't have that level of it. Um, but there's many, 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 many different aspects of the vampire lore that are you know, pretty easy to convey, uh, even in small, subtle ways. 
And the one that really struck to me was the idea, yes, of the of the shapeshifter, of in a way sort of embracing a bit more of almost the the succubi or incubi aspect of it. It just yeah, it just seemed completely logical and the way like the main like conceit of the film because I knew that there was so much story purchase that I could get from that and to me that was also very much channeling the the terror that comes out of you know getting so drunk that you're just blacking out and you're missing time and your and faces are faces are shifting and it's like all right uh and you know that it was interesting then because then we go into I think the other big character in the film besides Massimo which is the actual central vampire, Lucky slash Sophia. Um, and I think the, the, one of the first lines that stuck into my head when I was writing it was the interchange where he looks at her when she's first turned into Sophia and says, who are you? Who do you want me to be? And that's when I realized that it was going to be a really interesting psychosexual power dynamic between them. And the funny thing is, on set... When I was, you know, directing the actors, there was a lot of there was a lot of time and diligence paid to uh, to where we were in the progression of the narrative because there were many many scenes where we would film it either two different ways or know that this that the setup was going to be used two different ways uh, because it's an unreliable narrator in the story. And with uh, Megan Deanna Kingsley uh, playing. Sophia, you know, the main part of the vampire and everything, it was a long discussion as to who she had just shifted out of being and who she was going to shift into after that and the why behind it. And I just kept telling her that I was like, okay, I was like, I know this seems like a weird comparison, but for Sophia, she's kind of like the Mick to Massimo's Rocky. She just really (laughs) wants to train him to be the best damn vampire he possibly can be. Um, and the son of a bitch just won't listen to her. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and that was basically how we sustained it. Cause that's, that's one of those things that I loved the most was the fact that every, in, in my personal opinion, it's like everything that she was telling him, um, was very positive. It was all very easy. That it's like, you don't have to worry about going out and working a day job anymore. You don't have to worry about any of this anymore. You don't have to worry about love and family and all that bullshit that just, makes you old before your time you're a vampire you could literally go and do whatever you want you can eat whatever you want you can have no loyalties whatsoever why won't you understand how amazing that is when it's like yeah because that's that's the easy answer of of the the dopamine rush from getting drunk mm-hmm. that's the easy that's the easy answer so you know i i found her character very fun the stick in the mud is massimo because he wants to like you know be moral and stuff, but Sophia was just a pure Dionysian release. Actually, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. I almost felt watching this, especially the Sophia character, you could have almost spun this down her path because what, what are the things, whether you meant to or not, I was getting this sense of we were starting to get that little inkling of what it's like to be the, the, hierarchy of the the vampire from the perspective of she needs him as much as he needs her in this case because once he's she's turned him she's now not alone is what what has happened and you could explore that whole component unto itself the 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 master vampire that has to make others in order to just not be in eternity alone. <laughs> Suddenly you have a codependent relationship. Right. <laughs> right. We, which then goes along with all of the psychological stuff that you're trying to explore related to addiction. Right. Right. Well, there you go. Blood covered chocolate too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sophia's <Googling>. story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you, well, you don't want to go full Twilight. Now let's do the whole thing from her perspective. Right. <laughs> now, now, now we need shirtless werewolves. And... Right, right. Well, that, that's the other thing is that, like, it, I, yeah, that's the other interesting thing is going back to the original source on that, um, the, the original Dracula novel, 
I, I think one of the things that's so fascinating to me about Bram Stoker's original novel in comparison to many of the adaptations that have always been made of it is that Dracula isn't sexy in the novel. No. Uh, he, his level of seduction is far more primal. It's, it's like being hunted by an animal. Um, and I think... There's, it's, it's just so interesting to me that there was this shift into trying to make vampires, or not trying, I mean, exploring it as sort of this giving in to true passionate love, where there's this interpretation that it's like, vampires care about you so much that they just want all of you. And it's one of those things where it's like, uh, Dracula's a bit rapey in the book. Yeah, He doesn't ask for consent. Uh, so to me, it's, no, it's all about like, dominance. Yeah. So to me, it's like I, I was on the other hand just sort of sick of the the romanticization of the vampire in that sense. So it's like if you have somebody that's literally draining you in that way, um, it's not healthy. It's not healthy at all. No, I do like the addiction kind of a- angle on that. I, it, it, it parallels nicely. Well, I like you did a little bit of a, a role reversal from a a fairly typical vampire story uh, or other vampire stories it's almost always male vampire vampire lusting after the the, the right. female human and you reverse that a little bit by making this vampire female yeah it's it's interesting because um it's like as i thought about um you know the inspirations that were coming to me and then take something like mystics and valley which has a whole which character in it who is searching for youth by draining, you know, an, a younger woman. Uh, I, yeah, it was just one of those things where it's like the, the gender dynamic of it. It's like, let's, you know, get out of the, the usual thing that we've seen many, many times of alluring main vampire, virginal woman wanting something out, out of life, it, upset of, with her, you know, her straight laced boyfriend, probably played by Paul Rudd or whatever. It's just like, <laughs> You know, it's one of those things that's like we we've seen that, and um, you know, yeah, you want to make something that feels unique and fresh within something that's that's very very familiar. You want to take everything and turn it on its head, um, and yeah, that was the fun thing was basically being like, okay, the whole thing has homagic uh, elements to it, but I want to change them around and infuse. Um, my own plight into it so that it can, it can feel new again. I loved your, your casting when it came to Sophia. We talked about this in our review. Uh, Megan Deanna Kingsley has such an unconventional beauty about her that she's on the screen. You can't help, but I mean, that's not the time that you're going to be looking at your phone. Right. She, she is really a very mesmerizing looking person. Yeah, I have to thank actually um, one of the producers on the film for uh, for getting her involved. She actually was not the first person that I was uh, going to cast in the role. Um, the actress that I did want to work with um, was unable to do the part, and he uh, Frank Merle is his name. He was one of the one of the producers on the film. I was basically like, eh, I'm looking for that, and then he had actually worked with her on another film, a horror film he made called for jennifer from jennifer one of the jennifer films um and for she's jennifer. yeah she was she was in that and um i had met her at like the the premiere of that film like many many years ago and so he recommended her and i i knew that she was very good at um playing comedy um, because she plays a very comedic character in that and everything. And I was like, absolutely. I mean, I could just tell from his film that she had charisma for days. And when we were, you know, lighting the film and obviously, uh, it was one of those things where the film, the film was specifically lit and shot by our, our DP, uh, Neil Tyler's name, um, for black and white the whole time. We actually had, uh, LUTs that we used within the camera so that I could get a preview of how it would be in the black and white and also how it would be in the blue or the red. And we were filming this scene where um, Massimo's sitting in bed. He looks over to her in the bed, and she's just lying there with the eyes open and the fangs and everything. And we spent uh, 
probably a good two hours just lighting that shot. Um, and I remember Neil leaning over to me at one point and was like, she has perfect facial structure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's great for your shadow, isn't it? Your shadow and your light. It's, it's awesome. You know, she, she, especially with the bangs and everything, to me, she was the embodiment of the hammer or vampire, female vampire. And I loved that like aesthetic aspect of her. And then, yeah, on top of that, her acting, it was one of those things where it's like in the hands of anybody else, her lines are the most that walk the line of tongue firmly planted in cheek, but she grounds it in a way. Mm. Um, and it's, it's deceptively hard to do. And I mean, everybody is, was great and an absolute pleasure to, to work with. And I mean, the interesting thing about Michael Klug, who played Massimo in the film, who had to be in every scene in the film, he had uh, six days to prepare for that movie. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the act, I, he wasn't originally cast as the as the part either. Um, oh, really? No. Yeah. I cast another actor, um, and we actually filmed with him for one day. The opening scene of the film, where he's walking down the uh, storage facility hallways and everything like that, uh, somewhere. Uh, once again, if it ever gets a physical release, it would be an interesting comparison. Um, we actually shot, and I cut that whole sequence with that actor. It was one of the first things we filmed, the other actor. And, you know, you put those two scenes together, they're pretty much shot for shot the same. In fact, little factoid, the inserts when he's, like, looking at the bag of money and everything, that's actually the other actor's hands. Oh. I, just didn't, I just didn't reshoot those shots <laughs> um, to save myself some time. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> but he... Um, yeah, he basically, it, we, we shot it during the pandemic. Um, you know, we were taking all of the COVID precautions and everything like that. And, you know, being on the, the lower end of the budget and everything, we shot for him and then he sent me an email and he was basically like, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to say, man. I'm so sorry to do this to you, but I've been out of work for like a year and a half and I finally have a job and I can't say no to it. And so I, I, I just have to bow out and I'm like, I was like, go, go with goodness, my brother. Um, and we're, you know, still very, very good fil- friends. Actually, just incidentally, he's going to be in my next film that I'm going to oh, be nice. making. Oh, no, cool. So, cool. It, yeah, but it was one of those things where um, then it was like, okay, um, but I have my main principle of photography happening in six days. I had to, you know, go through the proverbial Rolodex, but right near the top, the first person I thought of was, the, was Michael. And I, I was just really very very fortunate that he jumped in with both feet and lived and breathed that part um because yeah it's not easy he's the lead he's in every single scene um and that was actually the only time ever in my my filmmaking career up to this point that i've ever had to do reshoots was um was that that scene and then we also shot um a couple of things out the 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 scene when they're um where he's giving, where his stepfather is giving him the money yeah. uh, and then pointing the gun at him. Interesting thing about that scene, that scene we actually shot at three different locations on two different days uh, <laughs> for various reasons that are, that are too much to, to go into. But like, it's really fascinating that it came out so perfectly. And I, and I just have to absolutely give it to my amazing crew for making that work. Um, because like the shots of the singles on Crate... Um, we shot that at a different time of day and we just used Duvetine to black out everything. It's not even night behind them. And then the reverses that are, are on uh, Michael, we shot out at the Salton Sea at night um, and it just matched perfectly, completely different sound. Like I didn't have to scrub any or ADR any of the sound in that scene, which was remarkable. So yeah, interesting, um, you know, classic low budget sort of stories behind that. Um, but it, everybody had a passion for it. They knew exactly what I wanted. So we kept things moving very, very fast. We shot that in 15 days. Um, and, and one of those days was, was the reshoots. Wow. Um, oh, wow. That's, yeah. That's a whirlwind shoot. There. I mean, you're, you're <laughs> yeah. talking like literally, oh, three working weeks. 
if yeah. you don't include weekends, and I'm imagining you probably included weekends. <laughs> well, yeah, more or less. I think we, yeah, we shot it, um, yeah, Monday to Saturday mm-hmm. for two weeks, and then I, and then I think there was just the odds and end a uh, couple of days there for various things. Um, but yeah, the movie's just laced with little moments like that, um, one, little wonderful tricks all around, like the scene where he's driving out in the desert in the car, and the, uh, the Spanish song is playing and everything. The, all of the shots of the car with the drone, that's just me driving the car. Completely different day. <laughs> yeah. You know, we get him over there. You know, it's it's just how you how you do it when yeah. you're at this level. Um, and, you know, if you do everything right, people don't notice. That's the, <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the, that's the trick. So, um, and, yeah. And I, could, I mean, I could go on and on about the cast. Because, like, then um, Deborah Lamb... Uh, who actually won an award for best actress for the film at shock fest, uh, which was just wonderful. Cause she's so amazing. And also kind of hilarious to me because I will be completely honest in the script. I didn't even give her character a name. She was just the, <laughs> mo- the mom, uh, but, and then she was actually the one that's like, I want this character to be, na- be named Barbara. And I'm like, absolutely. Okay, Sounds sure. great. Whatever you want. But what's interesting is that the the dinner scene early on, we shot that out with uh, two different cameras because I wanted that effect of um, just multiple angles going around that table with like literally a cutting on every sort of reaction. So there's the idea of just um, constant awkwardness of when you're having the worst possible like Thanksgiving dinner with the family member who's telling you that all of your life choices are terrible. <laughs> Uh, um, my, my inspiration for that was actually um, Ingmar Bergman's Hour of the Wolf. Um, there's that, that dinner scene that also has the like really rapid, you know. But it was one of those things where, you know, you watch that scene. Deborah has practically no lines whatsoever other than like, oh, we love this wine. Oh, we love this. Blah, blah. And all of that, all of her like reactions where she's just seeing his reaction, frown, you know, and all that and drinking the wine. All of that wonderful character stuff was just her, just her going off. It's like, okay, just run it, put a camera on her, have him play the scene, let's see her reaction. <laughs> so she she built that performance. There was very little for her on on the page. That that was her brilliance there. Oh, I love it. Um, I love it that they 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 came and going. Well, there's not much here, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that that was the huge advantage that I had on the film is that those actors, I mean, Deborah Lamb, Ellen Udy, um, Mike Ferguson, Christine uh, Nguyen, all of them have hun- like 150 some credits to them. Like they've done so many different horror films. They've been on so many different sets. I mean, Christine Nguyen was in and still is in a ton of like Jim Wynorski films. I, I came across her in um, Sharkansas Women's Prison. Um, <laughs> and I, I was watching that performance and I was like, that, that, that has, she has to be Tien. Like the, the, the way that she's playing that scene next to that CG shark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, you know, she was in like Fred Olin Ray films and like, like Ellen Udy goes, you know, way back. I was very, very fortunate in, uh, in terms of getting her. She was in, uh, the original My Bloody Valentine, and um, she oh, has right. she, she has one scene in um, No Lines, but she has one scene in Cronenberg's um, The Dead Zone, uh, which oh, I didn't wow. know originally. But what's so funny is that I rewatched that film like after we made the movie, and um, she plays Herbert Lahm's mother in the World War II flashback. So young in that, but like just amazing actress. And we, you know, she was coming in and playing the scene with like all those long takes. She had like seven different marks that she had to hit. And she just gave me a perfect performance every single take, which is great because I had no time to waste. So it's one of those things that all of them um, I, I would work with again and will work with again. And we, you know, it was very happy that I could tell they had a movie at the end of the day that they were very proud of and that made me very very happy uh because you know they were giving so much of their creativity and time and energy to do it and you know low budget films are not are not glamorous places to be but they are places where you can create something fun and interesting lower budget films and independent films there is a much more collaborative um atmosphere versus where i i think you 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 hear about it 
you hear stories about it in like bigger budget Hollywood films and everything, but a lot of that does, doesn't always ring true to me. But actually right. uh, seeing some of these films, actually being on some sets and realizing that you were there and there are people all around and no, no one frowns on someone going, well, what if he shot from over here? Or what if he was holding this? It's like, even if it's not an idea like, no, we can't do that because no one's offended by you putting your two cents worth in. Um, and sometimes it's like, oh, that's a great idea. Go get that. It, we'll do this. And it becomes like this, the thing that solves the problem. Absolutely. And it's, it's a hundred percent necessary as well. Cause it's one of those things where I like, like I go back to my, my DP Neil, who's also my uh, producing partner. And I have never worked with anyone who has done so much with so little um, ever. And what's interesting is he actually um, just completed directing his first feature, uh, which I helped produce. Um, And it's finalizing things with its distributor and everything. And it was the same sort of deal where we just sort of, I think literally we made both of our films like around the same time. Like he shot his, I think in the summer and then, I was picking mine up, you know, near the end of the next year. Like we were basically working back to back. And um, that was really good for that energy to have that kind of collaboration because we were literally developing the projects together as we were going along. And that's just how we've we've been working for the past like five years because I did uh, Blood Covered Chocolate is my second film. So my uh, first film, which is uh, currently up on Tubi and other places like that, he was the DP on that as well. And I'll never forget, I mean, whether or not you guys have seen it, whether or not you guys have any interest in seeing it, um, we shot that in a spaceship set. Uh, it's called it's called Space. Uh, and we, saw it, we shot it in a spaceship set. And I remember the last shot that we had to get in that set, we had rented it for a week in a place in Glendale um, called Funko Studios. And um, basically we had to do the load out, but we needed to get this like really important shot where we were putting it on the speed rail, moving the camera here and everything like that. And there were, we didn't have to do any sound on it, but I just remember like literally watching the man, you know, set up his lights and getting the shot ready. We were putting the action in position while they were breaking down the walls next to him. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's how you do it. It's one of those things that it's like, if you, if you can thrive in that energy, then I can only imagine a, a low, higher budget film set must feel a bit more cushy. I'm sure it always it will always come with its other set of demands and pressures and problems. And you know, then those directors, I mean, I look up to them because they're they're commanding entire armies to make films. Um, but. I, you know, it's one of those things that's like everybody, everybody has to start on that level. You know, it's like we, we hear the stories about, you know, Christopher Nolan, Robert Rodriguez making the $6,000, $7,000 movies um, and then hopefully making more. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things that it's like, yeah, I, I recommend that every filmmaker should do it. I sometimes wonder that it's like if you are fortunate enough to be a filmmaker where your very first movie is like a million five or something like that, which they always say, oh, it's such a low budget film. And I just always <laughs> la- laugh out of the other side of my face. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> um, Until you've put these on your personal credit card at, well, that has a max of $20,000. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You and haven't having... made a low budget film. <laughs> exactly. And that's uh yeah, it's interesting. It's like one of my um, one of my my buddies that I really admire these days uh, is a guy named Len Kapczynski. I don't know if you've ever watched any of his films. Not sure. Uh, he yeah, he makes um, movies out of uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and they are they're like uh, horror martial arts movies that you know he sh- he shoots. Yeah, I think you actually really dig them. Uh, you know, he shoots them for like six thousand um, dollars, and he's been doing it consistently for I don't know, twenty years or something like that. Wow! Well, nice. But uh, yeah, and his he got to shoot his most recent film, which had a pretty good um, Indiegogo campaign. Actually, uh, it was the last film that had uh, Leo Fong in it. But he uh, he shot part of that out in L.A., and it was a pleasure for me. I actually got to go and do a little location scouting 
and actually I recommended um, uh, Megan Deanna Kingsley did did a, a day player part on that mm-hmm. film and everything. But it's like he he's the kind of person that I look at and take inspiration from because he's he's had carved out a very long career um, mm-hmm. in the indie world with just nothing. You know what I mean? With with you know and finding his audience and giving him something that continuously pleases that pleases them. And having that kind of uh, following and camaraderie and support is nice. And that's the kind of thing that I think um, all independent filmmakers should be doing, is supporting each other, you know, continuously helping where they can. And I I love it. I think it's, you know, because you watch one of his films and you watch one of my films and they aren't anything like each other. (laughs) Um, But I... I love the way that he makes movies and I love the, the, the kinds of movies that he makes. I love those grindhouse sort of things. Um, oh, yeah. And he's, and he's committed to his, his vision, you know? And yeah, it, it's just one of those things where on this level, it's, it's all about relationships and respect and courtesy and helping each other out and being honest with people and following through on promises and doing what you can and lifting them up as much as you can. And, you know, that's the only thing that's going to matter with blood covered chocolate, the reception that it's been having, um, to me has been glorious, whether, whether or not, you know, it's, it's everyone's cup of tea or they, they watch it and they have, you know, questions about it or what have you. I'm been very, very happy that it's, finally found finding and found its way into the hands of the horror community because with my first film it was one of those things where i had it was my first experience you know i freely meant it's like i didn't know entirely what to expect on the distribution end of it which is a whole other journey uh, <laughs> for independent filmmakers and it's one of those things that it's like when you when you're first when you've got your first feature in the can especially like in genre and you're like, oh my god, you know, I really hope that the best thing that can happen is if I if I get a distributor for it, you know, and then you do, and then you have that moment where you sort of grow up, and you realize that every single distributor is going to fill their catalog out with a horror film because because they're easy to sell, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to treat you right. Um, they probably won't. <laughs> so it was one of those things where, you know, with blood covered chocolates, the fact that you gentlemen got to see it is a huge boon. And it's a huge credit to the distributor we got on it, Terror Films. That it's like that they took, and it was, you know, I was told even when I was like in the process of it, I, you know, had people advising me and being like, well, you know, black and white isn't, isn't all that sellable. And of course I kept, I kept giving them the song and dance of like, Oh, it's not black and white. It's a, it's a color film. Black and white just happens to be most of the color that you see. <laughs> uh, but there are other colors in it. Uh, but you know, it was also one of those things where I was like, look, if I don't, if I don't explore that aesthetic now, I might never do it. Cause right. it's like, you know, if I move higher up the, the ladder, which is of course what I hope, or even, you know, I just continue to make my films, the more that's expected of it, the less you get to take those risks and swing right. for the rafters. But I was like, this is this is what is going to make this film work. So there were a lot of distributors that just flat out said, no, we're not taking it because it's a black and white film. <laughs> but Terror saw what its potential was. And its potential, I think, is to is to have have a cult following to it. It may not be big. But I think that it's definitely going to continue to grow with people because because we put so much passion into it to try to at least make something that would make an impact. And, and it's it's a film that lends itself to all sorts of interpretation and, and discussion. Yes, I mean we we've been here discussing that, <laughs> and, and and but I mean it could go in so many directions, and honestly, that's part of what you watch film for anyway. Right, is to make that connection, to put yourself into it, and take out of it what as much as you did put into it. Exactly, and that's the thing is that like I, 
I love I love all horror film, and I love all um, different kinds of of goals that horror films have. So it's like for me personally, I don't know. Some some reviewers have said this about it, and I definitely can see it where they're like, "Oh, it's an art house horror film," and I'm like, "Sure, okay, that's fine." Um, to me, it's like that. If that's a turn off to people, that's fine as well. But I also know for a fact that it's like that's not my only bag. That was the journey that I wanted to take with this film. And then, you know, the most exciting thing to me, and the most exciting kind of filmmakers to me, are the ones that continuously break themselves um, to see what else, like, comes out of the piggy bank. So it's like uh, one of my absolute favorite filmmakers uh, in the horror genre and just in general uh, is Stuart Gordon. May he rest in peace. And it's one of those things that it's like when you watch when you watch something like say Robo Robot Jocks or um, when you watch you know From Beyond, and then you you look at something like Dagon, or even more importantly, if you look at something like Edmund or um, Stuck, which is fantastic if you guys have seen that one. Um, yeah, his his the 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 breadth and width of his style and what he wanted to explore like just knew absolutely no bounds and then another one for me is um like Takashi Miike where it's like the man's made 100 directed 150 films and it's like you remember audition or Ichi the killer but then he's he's done like musical comedies <laughs> you know what mm-hmm. I mean it's just like he's done samurai <laughs> films or it's like or back in the day somebody like um Howard Hawks where it's like, you know, gentlemen prefer blondes compared to something like Big Sleep compared to Rio Bravo. And you're like, yeah, that's all the same guy. I always think of a, a Robert Wise when you're talking about yeah. that sort of thing, where, you know, he'll do um, one of my favorite films, 63, The Haunting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, then he also does, um, and the name just left me, the musical. Um, West Side Story? West Side Story. Yeah, and Sound of Music. Yeah, <laughs> and I Sound of Music. Was, yeah. And then flash forward a little bit 1979 he's directing a star trek film you know? yeah <laughs> yeah or i think about like um yeah I, oh i love rob wise I, I you know i was just re-watching the drama strain the other day uh because I, I find his use of split screen in that movie very fascinating yeah uh, very old school but uh, um but very fascinating and that's like latter robert wise and but then you go back like that you know his very I think it was his very first film was Curse of the Cat People that he did for Val Luton. Yes. And like the Body Snatchers and oh, everything. The Body Snatcher is another, that film blows me away. Yeah. 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 And I mean, it, it's, um, I mean, those, those are, those are the master classes basically where it's like, you know, you go back and you watch that kind of mood and tension and you're just racked by, by um, basically, you know, you, you have a scene like in Body Snatchers where you just have Boris Karloff walking up to a door and the sounds of his footsteps and you're absolutely terrified. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, that's that's one of those things where it's like if, if they can create tension out of that, you can create tension out of anything. Well, before we uh, let you go, Monty, there was a couple things I wanted to mention. One, I wanted a chance to give credit where I think credit is due is the uh, the poster, at least the one that we're looking here. That's like <laughs> like IMDb. Yeah. The poster for Blood Covered Chocolate is flipping amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely that's Simon Richard. That's a UK artist. He's fantastic. He has, uh, yeah, he's done. Um, He's done art, I think, for like Delirium magazine and things like that. He's just done a lot of different things. I, it's interesting because he, I got connected to him and commissioned him to do the poster through Deborah Lamb once again. And it was one of those things that it's like as as we were talking about the uh, the film and what it was going to be, I was like, oh yeah, it's a, it's very much an homage to the, the the classic era of horror. And I knew that I was like, you know, I'd really love to have a classic Hammer Horror style kind of painted poster. And it was one of those things that it's like, I needed to find the artist who could capture that energy. Um, and yeah, everybody everybody loves the poster as well. They should because it's very very good. And what's interesting is actually when um, when I sat down to talk to the distributor Terra Films about like with the movie and everything, they wanted to cut their own trailer and everything. 
And I was basically like, okay, yeah, but you guys aren't getting rid of the poster, right? <laughs> You're not changing that thing. <laughs> Could you say the artist's name again? Because I think it might, the... the uh, Simon Pritchard. Simon Pritchard, thank you. I think our, yeah, our connection just artist. hiccuped right there when you said it the first time. Yeah, out of, out of the, the UK. Um, it's a great guy. Yeah. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, and I he he let let me uh, keep the original, which was very kind of him. Oh, I always, cool. always have a place for that. So, yeah, we really enjoyed a lot about this film, and we were mm-hmm. kind of we were trying to to convince ourselves that we liked the entire thing, right? Uh, and we wanted to get inside your head. We wanted to get answers, and I think we got a lot of the answers we did. Uh, that we were kind of looking for, and it explained a lot about you know what we saw and what we saw was maybe reasons for shortcomings and, and, and where some of the, the highs came from and everything. And so, yeah, I, I think I've been able to cross myself into the, I liked it, uh, camp. <laughs> uh, but regardless, it was definitely a film that made us both think we want to keep track of your films and see what you come up with in the future. So I'm excited that you actually have got something coming up. Uh, thank you. That, that definitely means a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, if all goes well, uh, because we we actually roll cameras in just a little over a week, um, and it, the film is um, called Bitter Tooth. Bitter Tooth. Bitter um, Tooth. Yes, and it's um, it's going to be completely different. Is basically all I can say. It's um, it's going to be in color. Uh, it's. <laughs> um, it's leaning into uh, another aspect that I find very fascinating um, as a storyteller, which is basically the way that film came about was um, my very first movie space uh, was a found footage film, basically. Um, And it was, you know, an outer space movie with like fixed cameras mounted on the spaceship. And that was the justification for the found footage. Um, and I was approached um, to make a another horror film that was originally the pitch to me was to do it as uh, as a found footage film, and I sort of sit on the fence myself with a bit of found footage in the sense that mm-hmm. I feel like it's a uh, it's it's a genre that's been very well explored and um, could very much find itself going into cliche uh, because it's been so well explored. But for me, early on, when I was in talks about making Bitter Tooth, I decided that I was like, you know, I don't, I, I, I want to use the found footage idea as a way to um, explore the fact that we as a society have basically come to the place because of the advance of our technology and our communication tools that we live in found footage. Like, take what we're doing right now. We have never met in person. This is our experience of each other is through, through these screens. And we, you know, if you were to see this in a movie, you're just like, oh, yeah, Skype calls and everything like that. So that's one aspect of it. Um, Bitter Tooth is going to be a crime thriller about true crime podcasters. Interestingly enough, podcasters <laughs> who, uh, who want to, um, you know, take it upon themselves to, to solve a mystery um, which is maybe a bit of a foolhardy prospect. But at the same time, it's like I have the opportunity to jump between the reality of being on camera in a podcast and then the reality of trying to track down a serial killer. Um, so that's where it starts. And then there are there's going to be a bunch of twists and turns along the way that uh, just have to see. Yeah, excellent. No, that, that's Looking great, forward uh, to it. It's a, it's a, that's a great elevator pitch there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, and everybody's been great on this one. It's a lot of the um, a lot of the same people. Same, it's the same DP as Blood Covered Chocolate. Uh, a lot of the same crew. We've got uh, Ellen Udi back, as well as Joe Joe Altieri, who did the stepfather of Blood Covered Chocolate. He's yep. um, he's coming back for Bitter Tooth. Uh, as I said, the actor that um, I originally wanted to play Masmo was going to get to be in this one, and then I'm just working with a lot of other really talented uh, new actors who I haven't worked with before um, who just blew me away with their auditions and everything like that. And I've been really, I'm really excited, really happy, excited for everybody to see this. And 
I think that um, I can say that probably you'll be able to watch this film, Bittertooth, before the end of the year. That's oh, wow. How, that's how quickly it's coming together. Excellent. Nice. Well, we certainly wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> um, we want to thank you for coming on and talking with us about your film. Um, it's been very interesting, very enlightening, and I, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, this was, appreciate the time. Yeah, absolutely. And anytime, you know, when when you guys get to see Bitter Tooth, uh, <laughs> maybe we'll reconvene to talk about what that was like. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely love to. Yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, Monty, thank you again. Uh, please, uh, everyone, go look for uh, Blood Covered Chocolate and check it out for yourself and, you know, get your own opinion on the film. And, uh, and keep an eye out for Bittertooth, hopefully coming by the end of the year. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, thanks again, Monty. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.